This is the orange bird. You probably recognize him. He's largely been an obscure figure in Disney Parks history, but he's gained a bit of prominence in the last decade or so. Originally, he was an invention of Adventureland before Magic Kingdom officially opened. Disney designed him in collaboration with the Florida Citrus Commission. This commission would sponsor various attractions in Adventureland, including the Tropical Serenade, and especially the Sunshine Tree Terrace, where most of the orange bird's contributions would be displayed. As a bird with orange colors and orangish appearance, he's well suited to the job at hand. He was made almost exclusively to sell branded merchandise and be an adorable presence for Florida orange juice in the parks. As time went on, he did succeed in that, but when the Citrus Commission and Disney parted ways in 1987, he too would soon fade into obscurity, unintentionally afloat among an occasional memory. But he wasn't gone forever. The orange bird would make a surprise appearance at Tokyo Disneyland in 2004. His powerful comeback story begins here. As a result of the praise he received in Tokyo, he's now back at the Magic Kingdom, and his popularity among Disney fans worldwide continues to rise. It is a bird beloved by many, myself included. While corporate interference threatened his demise, the orange bird's novelty has yet to wear off, perhaps stronger today than ever before. What a story. The simple Disney Parks bird who returned. Before I get ahead of myself, this isn't a video about the orange bird. More so, it's about the Disney Parks journey that he represents. My hope is that his story of redemption can echo for another relatively overlooked Magic Kingdom fowl. If the orange bird can make such a comeback, then there is another bird of Disney Parks lore that we need to seriously recall from the depths of oblivion. Long ago, there was an owl and he called himself Hoot. On October 1st, 1971, Magic Kingdom opened its gates as the first park within the Walt Disney World Resort. The orange bird was there, yes, but he was about to be upstaged in a very big way. Disney World had small worlds, country bears, singing birds, and supposedly important dead guys. As a whole, the park was a great success, but its present thrills would be laughable compared to the extraordinary expansions Imagineering was already planning. Specifically, Western River Expedition, which was destined to be the Magic Kingdom's signature attraction, was heavily in development. As part of a vast area called Thunder Mesa, a space combining an array of experiences, the Western River Expedition would have been a dark ride stylistically similar to Pirates of the Caribbean. As a part of the first phase of Magic Kingdom expansion, the attraction was expected to open in the near future. The Western River Expedition, designed by Imagineer Mark Davis, would have consisted of a number of humorous audio-animatronic sequences based on Western tropes. These vignettes included scenes of serene prairies, lively western streets, stagecoach robberies, fiery forests, raging thunderstorms, and thrilling waterfall drops. As one of the largest and most complex Disney attractions at the time, it would have been an incredibly incredible experience. And at some stages in its long development, it was suggested that the entire adventure would be narrated by a wisecracking audio animatronic owl called Hoot Gibson. Upon the opening of Walt Disney World, finicky Florida residents immediately began to question why they didn't have a Pirates of the Caribbean of their own. The Disneyland experience was just a few years old at that point, and understandably an attraction like it was in demand for the Magic Kingdom. Floridians had no idea Disney World was planning to exceed these expectations with its Western River ride. However, in typically unwestern fashion, Disney didn't stick to their guns, and Western River Expedition, while not officially canceled, was put on hold as they rushed to add some form of pirates within the Magic Kingdom. Floridians would get their enjoyable but subpar version of pirates in December 1973, but not before they'd also get a little taste of the magnificence they chose to delay. In April of that year, the Walt Disney Story would open in the Town Square Exposition Hall. A thoughtful documentary detailing Walt Disney's life and legacy would be shown inside, and upon exiting the movie, guests would enter into a lobby filled with Disney artifacts and memorabilia, and a preview of a future Magic Kingdom experience. While it was still officially tabled, Disney went ahead and hyped the experience anyway. A three-dimensional model of one of the scenes from the Western River Expedition was on display. Guests could lean in close and observe the many details that soon awaited them in Frontierland at some point. 
A nearby alcove featured a display of an owl audibly snoozing on a perch before a busy and button-filled audio animatronics control board. Meet Hoot Gibson, the owl and honorable introducer for the new Western River Expedition. This version of Hoot was designed by Mark Davis specifically for the Walt Disney Story Post Show. As a living ambassador for the imminent and revolutionary dark ride, Hoot Gibson would in addition serve as an educator on the history and the art of the audio animatronic. While Hoot Gibson shared his name with classic Western movie star Hoot Gibson, he had enough charm himself to be singular and stand out all his own. In spite of his tenure in the Magic Kingdom stretching nearly two decades, video and images of Hoot Gibson remain exceedingly rare. Perhaps that's fair since Hoot Gibson did spend a good chunk of his time sleeping and snoring. However, if curious guests were to wake him up by pressing the button placed in front of his display, he'd be more than happy to take you through his personal family album, telling you a lot about who he is and what he was going to be. <laughs> show being made for Walt Disney World. I'm what they call audio anim animatronic. animatronic. <laughs> you see, before my time came along, Walt Disney's characters were strictly movie star types. My grandpa, for example, had one of the lead roles in Bambi. But with all due respect, he and the rest of the family were sort of flat actors, yeah. They were at least flat drawings. <laughs> Well, one day, Walt Field was high time to work up some three-dimensional animation. It took years and years of thinking and tinkering. First, there were little bitty figures, and then full-size ones. And finally, out of all of this came a brand new kind of animation Walt called anima, an, audio, anim, audio animatronics. Hoot then went on to describe some of the audio animatronic offerings that guests could see in the park today, like the Mickey Mouse Review. Then he would go into detail about how he himself was created, showing behind-the-scenes photos of how he was sculpted, wired, and put together. As Hoot drew our attention to the control panel before him, computers beeped and lights flashed, and each button seemed to inspire something distinct within him. I got my schooling from a mighty smart fellow in his computer console. Lots of console center button because it works my beak. Meanwhile, across the country in Disneyland, the Main Street Opera House also offered a showing of the Walt Disney story, although here, an audio-animatronic owl, who remains nameless in this instance, could be found in the pre-show lobby. Much like Hoot Gibson, he spoke highly of Walt Disney and specifically highlighted his contributions in conservation, particularly through the production of True Life Adventures. I guess I must have dozed off. <clears throat> and, all right, class, before you go in to see the main show, I want you all to know the important part that we animals have played in the Walt Disney story. You see, many of Walt's most popular stars weren't people types at all. No, no, sir, they, they were animals. And thousands of genuine live animals were the real stars of Walt Disney's famous film series, The True Life Adventures. This owl played more of an educator. Disney stalwart Hans Conrad voiced his speech with a touch more distinction. While his aim wasn't quite the same as Hoot Gibson, he did inform and he would continue to talk about true life through the early 2000s, when the square-capped owl of Disneyland would give his final lesson. The next time you are in the great outdoors, you give a hoot about the animals, you see. Why, they may be the next Disney stars. <laughs> Ooh, no. Back in the Magic Kingdom, Hoot Gibson remained, delivering his audio-animatronic speech to anyone who would listen. 
However, after nearly seven years of the same story, it became obvious that the amazing Western River expedition he perpetually promised had been cancelled. While some of its elements would manifest in attractions like Big Thunder Mountain Railroad, the ultimate vision of a Hoot-hosted boat ride seemed to fade away. But Hoot Gibson wasn't done. In June 1981, Hoot's involvement would be needed to promote another new experience coming to Walt Disney World. The Walt Disney Story was transformed into the appropriately named Epcot Center Preview Center. A short film called The Dream Called Epcot was screened in place of the Walt Disney Story. This film explained and highlighted the drive, the motivation, and the dream for Walt Disney World's upcoming second gate. As guests would exit the film, they would encounter concept art, descriptions of future attractions, and a giant model of the entire park. And of course, who else but Hoot Gibson? Although here he goes by his full name Hooter and he utters not a single word about the Western River Expedition. Complete in a tour guide getup, Hoot Gibson perched atop a flashy computer tower took us through his updated family album. This edition highlighting new experiences that actually would be available in the imminent Epcot Center. As you can see, I'm more than fine terms of a wise old face. Hooter's the name, and I'm just one of the many lively characters here at Walt Disney World. We're all part of a three-dimensional system that combines sound, woo, animation, and electronics. <laughs> That's audio animatronics. At Epcot Center, a whole new generation of audio animatronics characters will be brought to life. But why just talk about them? Let me show you. After all, one picture is worth a thousand words. A dear words. A thousand words. Epcot opened in 1982 to great anticipation, largely as a result of the informative talks Hoot Gibson gave in the preview center. As another decade was drawing to a close, 1988 found a new Disney World theme park peeking over the horizon, providing Hoot Gibson with fresh material to discuss. As a spokesperson within the Disney MGM Studios Preview Center, he would trade his Epcot computer and tour guide cap for a director's chair and a beret, showcasing what would soon be found inside the groundbreaking studio theme park. With Disney MGM Studios officially opening in 1989, Hoot's preview spiel seemed less relevant, so he chose to keep his mouth shut. With his activation button deactivated, Hoot Gibson perched there in silent slumber until I guess he just couldn't take it anymore, and he flew the coop. The Walt Disney Story venue in Town Square would soon be occupied by the 25th Anniversary Celebration Center and then the Animal Kingdom Preview Center, both of which would have been perfect opportunities for Hoot Gibson to appear again and inform, inspire, and invite Disney World guests back to see the new attractions that were coming. Hoot Gibson, however, was nowhere to be found. In fact, he is yet to be seen in the parks again. Despite nearly two decades in the Magic Kingdom, Hoot Gibson remains a captivating enigma. Never before and hardly since has one particular figure left such a gaping void. He arrived as a preview, but he stayed as an authority, an expert in his field. Confined to a limb himself, he bolstered our anticipation, and he made it soar. Hoot Gibson was adaptable, and much like the Disney parks that inspired him, his work would never be completed. He managed to be behind the scenes and upfront entertainment all in one. He was interesting, and he knew exactly why. He showed us what was coming, and he was self-aware enough to understand what made him special. He was an audio animatronic, the ultimate form of Disney animation. And he was proud about it, and he was proud of the parks that employed him. He found joy in those walls, and Hoot Gibson's passion for the parks shined through each of his words and movements. And then Disney just let him fly away. There's no shortage of audio animatronic owls in the Magic Kingdom today, but they all lack that particular touch, that special spark that's something sensational. So, will we ever learn from Hoot Gibson again? Well, no one can know for sure, but we can have some confidence that he's keeping track of current events and staying close at hand. 
At D23 Expo in 2013, Hoot can be seen quietly stationed in an Imagineering pavilion, right next to a certain hatbox ghost, who would go on to make an official reappearance at Disneyland in 2015, and is rumored to be making a similar visit to the Magic Kingdom soon. Why shouldn't Hoot Gibson do the same? Hopefully he can follow in the flight path of that magnificent orange bird who preceded him, and we all will once again be the recipients of Hoot Gibson's exceptional wisdom. Whether it be as he informs us of forthcoming Walt Disney World offerings, or perhaps, at long last, as the star of his much-awaited Western River expedition. Come on, Disney. Make the call. Give a hoot. Until next time, we'll see you in the happy place. Bye. Can't hoot without an air hose. <laughs>